Hello, my name is Dror Khan. Welcome to the Sunday platform of the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. Today's program is on freedom and risk with artist Edel Rodriguez. Too often, we are quiet. We don't speak up and we do what's expected of us because we are afraid of the risks involved. Edel Rodriguez will talk about his family's journey, how those events influenced his work and the power that art has to speak for people when they are at the crossroads of history. Before we get to the talk with Adele Rodriguez, let me tell you about the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. It is one of some 26 societies that belong to the American Ethical Union. We believe that ethics is the platform upon which atheists and theists can stand. Our mission is to spread ethics. We meet Sundays for community, education, personal growth, and talks such as this. Today, Idel will tell us his story and show us some of his artwork. You may have already have seen some of it. He has had exhibits in many countries and his illustrations have been seen by millions on the covers of books and magazines and as posters in public places. He is now working on a graphic memoir, which will be published in 2023. I'm looking forward to reading it. Please welcome Idel Rodriguez. Um, so uh, in 1959, uh, there was an insurrection in, in Cuba. Um, the military had been, um, uh, you know, the, the Batista's government had taken over the, the country and rebels had um, gone uh, into the mountains of uh, the eastern uh, side of Cuba. And in uh, January of um, uh, 1959, they came into the city, um, the rebels came in, and they were greeted with signs um, of, you know, long live the revolution, homeland or death, which were um, some of their slogans. Uh, a couple of years later, um, Fidel Castro, which is the leader of the, uh, of the revolutionary movement, gave a big speech on the plaza uh, where he, um, he, he decided that, um, um, he stated that uh, uh, elections were no longer necessary. <laughs> uh, why do we need elections? Um, we stand for the people and, and the people have spoken. So from that day in 1960 um, uh, onwards, uh, there were no elections uh, in Cuba. In 1965, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the entire planet almost were, uh, went into a, uh, a nuclear war because it was in the middle of the Cold War in, between the United States and uh, Russia. And uh, Cuba was being used uh, as a base by, um, by the Russians. Um, Six years later, I, I was born. <laughs> um, so in the middle of this, this uh, Cold War situation, I was born in 1971. I grew up in this uh, small town in Cuba called El Gabriel. Um, uh, it was a, basically a village of about four blocks by uh, four blocks. Uh, it was mostly workers from the uh, nearby sugarcane refinery. The town was surrounded by uh, political um, billboards, posters, and slogans. Um, some of the slogans uh, were like, um, you know, until victory always, uh, we will be like Che, socialism or death. Um, and those kinds of slogans and statements sort of made a, a big impact on a little um, boy that was um, uh, walking uh, around town. Uh, also at school, uh, we were surrounded by political propaganda, uh, similar kind of posters of, um, uh, you know, uh, the one on the left which says always faithful, um, which fiel is means faithful in Spanish, so very close to Fidel. So they use these words to try to kind of um, indoctrinate the kids to, to sort of become future um, leaders of the revolution. Another thing that um, influenced me as a child was were the regular uh, military parades that were on, on television. They're pretty constant, um, uh, very similar to the Russian parades in, in, um, in Red Square. Uh, but these were conducted in the Plaza de la Revolución in, in Havana. 
and uh, we were um, told to uh, dress in uniform. So we had uniforms at school, uh, and they were kind of, you know, the little red beret, um, the, uh, um, uh, the very kind of, kind of uh, um, all very much symbols. Uh, it all related to symbols of the revolution. So the 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 schooling in Cuba was pretty much tied to to uh, supporting um, uh, what was happening uh, with Fidel Castro and the revolution. So all of this stuff that I was um, surrounded by ended up showing up in in some of my drawings. One of the first things that I remember drawing were military tanks um, and uh, uh, military battles and things like that because it's what I was obsessed with as a young boy. Another uh, thing that influenced me were was my grandmother. So my, my grandmother, every night, she would uh, put me to uh, sleep on the porch and she would tell me these fantastical stories about uh, religion and Santeria and voodoo. Um, she was obsessed with death. <laughs> and, you know, she'd start a, a, a nice little story and it always end up with like someone, um, you know, found dead in, in the sugarcane field or something. <laughs> So all these things had a lot of impact on, on you know, whenever I'm, I'm stuck for imagery, I always think of my grandmother's uh, stories. Uh, but one of the things I found interesting about my grandmother, even though she talked all the time and she told me all these stories, occasionally she'd go, shh, be quiet, shh, don't talk, not now. Or, you know, the walls have ears. And uh, I always wondered, you know, what that was about. Uh, why she was um, she would do that all of a sudden, uh, and the reason was that if you were not with the revolution in Cuba, uh, you were basically considered an antisocial. Okay, um, it, they they would call you a worm, um, um, a degenerate, all sorts of things like that. You had to stand with the revolution, and a lot of people in my family were not that political. They mostly just wanted to. Um, you know, live their life, speak their mind, you know, they were used to what life was like before the revolution, which was a pretty freewheeling, you know, um, regular life where people just spoke their mind and things like that. Um, so this is my family in 1979 uh, at my uh, grandfather's uh, farm. And within a year, uh, about half of them, you know, half of us would be gone. By now, there's no one left in Cuba anymore. Everyone has left. Um, so the reason we left in 1980 was the Mariel boat lift. Uh, the Mariel boat lift was a um, um, something that was set up um, between um, Cubans in Miami and Cubans uh, in Cuba. There were there were a lot of people that were already protesting in the streets against the revolution, and Castro was trying to find a way to get uh, rid of them. So um, what, what he decided is he uh, decided to open up the ports and told the people, the Cubans in Miami, if you want to come pick up your families, um, you, can, uh, you can do so at the port of Mariel. So a lot, my family in Miami decided to go pick us up. But before we left the island, we were in a um, detention camp uh, in, in uh, Cuba. Uh, we were um, put there for about a week. And this is kind of what, you know, some of the visuals of that uh, detention camp looked like. Uh, while we were in the detention camp, they would pull people uh, out of the camp um, and uh, take them to their um, where they used to work, beat them up and bring them back into the camp. Um, the, uh, they were also trying to get rid of prisoners and uh, uh, they, they would bring prisoners from prisons, put them right next to the families in the camp. And um, uh, it created all sorts of you know, um, issues within the camp itself. Uh, then on May 1st, 1980, we took off for uh, Key West. This is the boat that we left on. It's called Nature Boy. It was a boat that was uh, owned by a couple of Jamaican shrimpers. Um, and they, uh, they talked to my family in, uh, in Miami. Uh, they made a deal to go pick us up and they eventually took all of us, which is about 30 family members, plus about 60 other um, people that the Cuban government wanted to get rid of. So they got rid of um, gays, um, lesbians, um, transsexuals, uh, um, prisoners, uh, uh, 
people from insane asylum. So anyone that they, they thought were degenerates um, and they didn't want them in the country anymore, they figured this was a good opportunity to get rid of them. Um, and they ended up on our boat and uh, we ended up, we landed in Key West um, uh, on May 1st, 1980. Uh, these are some scenes sort of from my imagination of what the boat trip was like. This is a photograph of me on the boat that I found about two years ago on Facebook. <laughs> um, the, our, on our boat, there were photographers uh, that had, uh, they had taken the boat from Key West to Cuba with the, the boat shrimpers. And um, they, on the way back, they decided to just cover this story because they, they, they were on the boat and they, they took so many photographs of my family um, and um, I actually met a photographer a few years ago that, that linked up with me and uh, gave me all these photographs of, um, of my family on the boat. And um, this is one of uh, me, but it's, uh, it's, it's been great to have and my family has them all framed in the house now. Um, so uh, when we arrived in the United States, I ended up in Miami in a small part of Miami called Hialeah, which is mostly a Cuban uh, enclave right now and was at the time as well. But overnight, I went from uh, sort of this Cuban revolution in the graphics of the revolution to American pop culture. So bands like, uh, became fascinated by rock and roll bands like Kiss, Van Halen, rap. So this sort of mi you know, mishmash of Cuban um, graphics and American graphics is something that happened to me at a very young age. Things like advertising. Uh, this is the first time that I was seeing um, uh, big signs on stores. There was nothing like this in Cuba. It was, uh, as I said before, mostly uh, political billboards. So this kind of graphics also influences uh, my work. Uh, and although we were, uh, you know, we were brought into the United States, we weren't necessarily welcome in the United States. There was also a lot of protesting Miami against the newly arrived uh, refugees. In 1990, I headed to New York City to study. Um, at Pratt Institute. Um, overnight, I you know from from you know living in Miami wasn't that culturally um, you know uh, on top of things back in 1999 or the 1980s. It is now, but when I arrived in New York City, this made a big impact on me. Uh, arriving in New York City and at the MoMA, the Guggenheim, and I decided to. Um, I, I told my mom I would go back to Miami, but I never have. <laughs> Um, and then now this is my studio now. Um, as you can see, it's a big combination of um, um, painting, drawing, uh, graphics, um, things like painting on cardboard. Uh, these are some of my uh, paintings. Um, so as I said, when I look for imagery, I, I think of all the stories of my past, um, things that my family told me, and I try to bring that into some of my work. Uh, this is a, a painting from a few years ago on the topic of, um, of refugees. And another thing that I try to do is I, I find a certain way of working and I, and I develop it over um, several images. So I did, you know, on this series, I, I wanted to just work with little white dots and I created uh, about 10 drawings this way. Um, this is, these are some um, images influenced by Cuban uh, Santeria. And now I take a lot of, I do my own studio and I bring it to my uh, assigned work. So I uh, have clients that want to do a, a Broadway poster, let's say, or a um, film poster, uh, opera poster. And I, I take a lot of those graphics that I develop um, in my own personal work, in my sketchbooks, and I try to bring some of that influence into um, some of this other uh, work. For example, this was a recent uh, poster for a film by um, uh, Joel Cohen for the tragedy of Macbeth. Um, and a lot of these things are things that I'm already kind of working on um, in my sketchbook and end up in these posters. There's another one for uh, a rock and roll band called Spoon. I did a series about nine images for, for, this, um, for this album. And I also bring some of uh, my 
kind of personal style into book covers. So I've done about, I think, 50 to 60 book covers now. Uh, this was a series for um, the African author, Chinu Achebe, who um, writes about the issues surrounding colonialism, uh, the British and uh, what happened when the British um, uh, were in Nigeria. Um, and this is another series for a Cuban, um, a Cuban uh, um, science fiction writer. And um, what he does is he, he, um, he lived in, in, or he lives in Cuba, but he can't really write about what's happening in society. So he just changes everything to science fiction. <laughs> So he'll, he'll, he'll write his books and, and, and um, never tell you that he's talking about um, the, the Communist Party or um, Fidel Castro, but, but there will be a monster and you know who that monster is. Uh, and he changes it all to another planet. And uh, his books are, not, are, are, are banned in Cuba. They're, they can't be printed there, but he, he has them printed in, um, in Spain. And now they're releasing them here through a, a, an indie publisher. I also create posters. This is at the poster house in um, on 14th Street. And these are some posters that I created for the School of Visual Arts. They have an annual um, subway campaign. And I did this uh, subway campaign right around two, 2018. Um, they said I could do whatever I wanted to do. And I said, well, I think the, the issue we're having now in 2018 is that people are not People are not waking up, they're not speaking up, and they're not rising up. And I made three posters about that. And they said, sure, um, which was great to have a, a university kind of like get on board with this, with this idea. Um, this is what they look like in the, in the uh, subway system. Uh, but the thing that I've become mostly uh, known for in the last few years, especially, uh, is magazine covers. Um, I think I've done about 200 different magazine covers. Um, this one, uh, th this wall was at the Bronx Community College when I had a show there. Um, these are a couple that I've done for Time and Newsweek. Uh, the one on the left is Mao wearing a Louis Vuitton jacket. It was for a story about how China was changing uh, about uh, 10 years ago and how the communist of China was becoming a sort of a nouveau capitalism. And the one on the right was when Osama bin Laden uh, was killed. Uh, happened on a Sunday, I think, and I had like one day to finish it. So I finished it for, for the next day. The first time that I saw what a magazine cover could do was when I created this cover um, for uh, communication arts. They were doing a story inside about um, Cuban design and how many, you know, maybe features on like seven or eight different Cuban artists and designers in, in, in Havana. And they asked me to create a cover. And uh, I had been thinking about this idea that how the revolution in Cuba itself in 2006 was changing um, because in the past we were, um, you know, my family would ask for, uh, for us to send them a care package of like medicines or food or things they needed. And around this time there were, they were saying, you know, can, can you send us some um, like uh, iPods? <laughs> uh, can you send us sneakers with, they should be Nike. And so the, 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 even the Cuban people themselves were changing and the revolution was no longer what it, what it used to be and had become much more about um, uh, products and consu you know, consumerism like the rest of, of the world. So I created this image and it got on, on the internet and on blogs and it became you know, very controversial or a lot of people against it, a lot of people for it um, and agreeing with it. But I, I, it made me realize that a magazine cover had, uh, had sort of become a political poster you know, uh, in some way. Uh, in 2014, I saw what ISIS was doing in the Middle East um, by um, you know, taking over uh, territories and, and, you know, what they were doing to women and uh, Yazidis and other uh, minority groups. Uh, and I didn't feel that the United States was paying enough attention to it or Americans weren't paying enough attention to it. So I started creating a series of images. I did about 15 to 20 images, mostly shared online, and they became um, viral uh, and uh, got a lot of attention in the media. Uh, it made me realize that the role of an illustrator had changed because we have our 
we basically as artists have our own printing presses at our hands right now, which is our phones. And you can use social media to kind of start these campaigns going uh, and conversations going around a topic that the media necessarily is not talking about, you know, uh, or the media wants to treat it uh, and handle it the way they have in the past. But that in the way they've handled things in the past often hides a lot of things. So I wanted to start using social media as a way to speak about things that weren't being discussed on the mainstream media. Um, and through these images um, that are, you know, a bit surprising or shocking, um, I thought that I could do that. I then took the images and started making posters of them and posting them around New York City uh, and seeing how the images interacting with people on the street. So for example, you know, this, this is an image of a guy, you know, I remember seeing ISIS uh, people uh, doing, taking selfies with beheaded figures, you know, people that they had beheaded. I thought that was disgusting. And so I created that image and then uh, paired it with the, this guy sort of watching a movie on his cell phone with the poster behind him, not really paying attention to the poster, uh, which I found pretty, pretty interesting. And it, it mirrored what was happening in America, which was we're very obsessed with, uh, with television and public culture and not really paying attention to the rest of the world. Um, then in 20... Uh, 15, 2014, 2015, when, when the election season started and the whole, um, you know, uh, MAGA, Red Hat thing uh, started, I started seeing kind of uh, uh, connections between the extremism uh, of, of ISIS and the extremism of the, um, of the uh, MAGA movement and also the white, white terrorist movement that's happening in the United States. Now I kind of saw this and every time I made one of these images, I'll, I would just be like, I'm gonna get in trouble. This is not good, <laughs> but I, I get the idea. And once I get an idea, I'm like, I gotta show it. I was like the kid that, you know, when the kid was drawing when I was seven or eight years old, you'd make something you wanna go show it to your parents. You go, look what I made, what do you think? Well, the same thing now, the same thing applies to me now, even though I'm 50 years old or 51. Um, so uh, I, I made this image. I basically just took an old terrorist image and change it up, put it online, and then I would get all this reaction from people going, yeah, you're right, that's what's actually going on. So um, it made me decide to, as I did before, the campaign that I um, did before against ISIS to create a new campaign against uh, what, someone that I saw as a, as a threat to America, which was this new candidate, you know, uh, Donald Trump, um, that was, you know, just coming out around 2015, uh, 2015 with the primaries. So uh, I created this sort of character um, based on, on Trump and I figured the, the easiest way to communicate was to uh, pare down all the colors. You basically use orange for his skin, yellow for his hair, red for his tie and black cat. And, and uh, I created sort of this personality and I started you um, putting um, my own commentary about whatever was going on during the primaries. There was a lot of insanity. I don't know if you guys remember when he was um, uh, debating Hillary Clinton and all that. So every time uh, he would say something or, or come up with some outrageous uh, statement, I would make an image and um, put it online. Now, my idea was if I do this enough, I know who's following me, mostly art directors and designers. Um, if I show this enough on, on the internet, hopefully these magazines will catch up <laughs> and want to publish something like this. Because I knew they wouldn't want to. But if, if they see it and they see the reaction that the audience has to it, maybe they would. Um, part of the reason why I started doing this entire campaign um, was when um, in 2016, I, um, I, I remember dropping my daughter off at school in the morning and this mom uh, came over to me and said, hey, I like what you're doing on the internet <laughs> with the Trump stuff. And I'm like, why are you talking like this? Why are you being so secretive? And she said, well, you know, maybe the teachers are Trump, Trump fans and I don't want them to, I don't want it to affect my child if, um, if something, if I say something, and then they, they would sort of, you know, treat my child differently because I, I don't like Trump or something. And, and it just triggered me and sent me back to when I was a kid in Cuba with my grandmother speaking very hushly and quietly. 
and I and I really went, well, we can't have this in this country. We can't have people quietly muttering and 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 not and being afraid to speak because of something that could occur to them or their child. And that moment is when I said, well, if I'm loud, if I'm the loud one and I create crazy, you know, out there uh, imagery, maybe other people will will sort of like get the courage to after they see my work to go, well, I'll speak up too, you know. And I think as an artist, you have to kind of be at the forefront of, of these things and and be the loud one, speak out so that other people um, uh, sort of have the courage to do that. And then and, uh, it's something that I had in my mind. And as you'll see in the rest of the, the slides, it'll come true because a lot of people ended up using my images uh, for protests. Um, they took them out um, and, and did all sorts of things with the images that I created. This is the first image uh, that I, uh, the first magazine cover that um, that landed with with the Trump character on the cover. Uh, I did it for Time Magazine. Um, they they had an idea of what they wanted to do. They and they just wanted to see if I if I was able to do it technically. They had the headline called Meltdown, and I did this, and I never thought it was going to uh, be published. I thought they would change it at the last minute or something. <laughs> Um, but the next morning, um, uh, actually, it was like a, a couple of months later, they asked me to to do sort of a follow up to that image. Uh, the first one's called Meltdown, and this one's Total Meltdown. But what happened instead of um, sort of it being, you know, something that I thought was going to be sort of a one day or a one week thing, it became kind of a media frenzy. The idea that that some artist was was treating the um, you know, a, a someone that was running for president in this way, and that a magazine would 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 promote it or put it under cover. It's pretty not co it's not common for someone in, uh, for a magazine in the middle of a campaign to be very critical of of uh, one of the candidates. Um, but um, what happened is that everything Trump was saying was taking everything to such a new level that the media sort of adjusted to what that level uh, was. Uh, since that image was very popular, I created my own posters. I started taking them around New York City um, and photographing them, also putting them online. So to sort of create this sort of, um, um, you know, effect where it's just duplicating. So everything that I do, I photograph it, I put it on the, the, in the internet and the internet kind of like magnifies uh, the thing that you did. The one on the right is actually a uh, coffee table at the Trump Hotel downtown. I went there like at midnight and dropped one off there. Also took some to Times Square. I tried to bring a little bit of like levity and um, jokes to some of my work uh, so, so that it's not just angry people <laughs> holding a Trump, Trump sign. Um, uh, I think comedy and, and um, something funny is also a way to get at, at people that disagree with you and that and, and that can also start a conversation so definitely try to use comedy and, and and something silly as much as possible in my installation and work uh then finally uh trump was elected in 20 um in 2016 and he went into office in January. And the first thing he did, one of the first things he signed was the, uh, the act, the Muslim ban, that banned Muslims from coming into the country. As a refugee myself, uh, I was very offended by it because it totally reminded me of me as a child uh, wanting refuge in the United States and being given it. And that all of a sudden there was a, a, um, a president that was denying people uh, refuge in, in the US. Uh, to me, the United States is all about uh, democracy, the Statue of Liberty, bringing in immigrants, uh, helping people that, are, that are, have gone through war. Um, that's how I saw the United States. And when I see a figure that um, wanted to, it was changing that I saw him uh, as the real terrorist. You know, that was that's the conversation going on in my head. This guy is terrorizing people. There were little kids that were left at the airport in JFK that were coming to the United States to be with family and they couldn't get out of the airport. Grandmothers coming in for surgeries from the Middle East and they were trapped at the airport. So I took an old image of mine, one of those terrorist images, and simply replaced his head and then added the Statue of Liberty. I put, it, I put this on my social media and it got so much attention that their Spiegel called me 
uh, and said, we really like what you're doing, what you've put up. Uh, can we put that on the cover of our magazine cover? And I was like, are you guys sure you really want to do that? <laughs> it seems like a lot for a magazine cover to do. And they're like, yes, we love it. It's very important. We want to publish it. So they did. They, they published this on their magazine uh, cover. Before it was on the print edition, it came out on Friday night on, online. And by Saturday morning, by the next morning, before the magazine was even out, people had already printed it out and made uh, political posters out of the magazine cover. And they, were, they took to the protests in New York City, uh, in San Francisco, in Denver. These, these appeared all over the United States even before the magazine was published. Um, it created a, a whole to-do. I was invited to a lot of um, televisions to, to shows to talk about my work on CNN, on Spanish television. Um, then, you know, am I Trump's most hated artist? <laughs> Just all these articles uh, started coming out. And what I, um, I did is, you know, I went to, to all these interviews. I felt like it was very important to talk about what was going on in the United States and to Kind of um, break a little bit of the 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 you know what was going on in the media you know uh, the idea that that this was a different kind of president and we needed to treat treat him in, in a different kind of way i saw trump from the very beginning as a danger to the united states right from the start um and i wanted to my work was about warn, warning people to tell to tell people this is not normal this is something different you guys have to pay attention and you know four years later we saw what happened in 2020 with the attack on the capitol you can't talk to 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 people and say all these things regularly without some result eventually happening and there is the end result was what happened in 2020 after the election um you know, to the point where I don't feel like I need to do this work anymore because my, my whole thing was to warn people, you know who he is now. It's, it's the facts have been borne out. Um, these are uh, the whole set of covers I created for Der Spiegel and Time um, at a, in a TV show in Germany. And Germany, since Der Spiegel is German, but also because of the topic, Germany really took my work and, and, and published it and had, had me on television shows and all that because Germany understands the danger that happens when you let a, a, a tyrant kind of keep doing things and pushing uh, uh, fascism or the edge of fascism. They understand, they understood the danger. So that's why my work was very kind of um, yeah, promoted or showed in, in Germany. I also made a lot of friends. So a lot of uh, this, these kinds of things happened on social media. This was on Instagram. Some strangers just wrote me, are you illegal? Another, uh, Person, I started getting emails, uh, and I actually have a whole folder of hate mail that I saved up. Um, you know that I I I should be stripped of my citizenship, uh, whatever. Um, basically, all these threats for making art, but I kept making it. <laughs> um, there's nothing that's going to um, make me do something more than you telling me not to do something, <laughs> or you uh, saying that I'm, you know. So it, it, it basically just creates more fuel for, for me to, to keep on going um, because I'm, I see that I'm uh, getting under someone's uh, skin. This is um, baby Trump and baby Kim Jong-un on a nuclear bomb. Um, this is a play on Magritte's, uh, this is not a pipe, and it says this is not a president underneath. Um, this is when the, the, the little children were um, caught in uh, or put into behind cages uh, at the border, a play on Goya. And this is a collection, you know, people would take my artwork and make their own posters. See that lady in the middle there? That's something that she painted herself. Um, so it inspired people to take this work out into um, protests. Uh, either printed or painted themselves, and um, what I heard from a lot of people would would be like, "Thank you. I didn't. I don't know what to do, but I, your work gives me something to hold and and something to stand behind, and um, you know, uh, gives them something to to take to these um, protests." Um, all of this show, work was shown um, uh, in various galleries. Uh, this is in um, at Portland. 
I think I created about 200 to 300 different illustrations um, during the Trump years. And they're all collected in this book um, that came out this past year is published by a museum in Spain. There was a big show in Spain of this work and it's all in this book. Um, this is my final cover of that sort of the Trump uh, work. And this was published on um, January, um, uh, January of 2021. It was uh, basically, I got a call the, the day as people were attacking Congress, they're like, Edel, do you want to create a cover for the New Yorker? And I created this cover, which was the American flag at half mast. Uh, I, I really felt like it was the end of, of, of the American dream. You know, this idea that, that a political party or members of a political party had attacked, had attacked uh, the Capitol. It just changed everything for this country. And it's, for me, it's just what I had been warning, warning the entire country about for four years. <laughs> Uh, that this could happen. Um, that work led to other um, political projects, uh, political poster projects for um, other people. This was a set of about um, 50 posters that I created for U2. Um, U2 went on tour in 2018. And what I liked about their tour is that it went not just to New York City and Los Angeles, it stopped in like Oklahoma City and Texas in Ohio. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to bring these kinds of graphics to states that don't necessarily see this kind of stuff. So I created all of these posters, um, English, math, science, guns crossed out. Um, this one, I was actually at Madison Square Garden, I think. Um, so as the crowd arrived, all of these posters greeted them sort of a, on a, as a slideshow. Then um, uh, later on in the tour, I created other banners that were, uh, they have this huge uh, jumbotron that, that floats over the crowd. And I created all these banners for them. Um, and uh, one more project that I wanted to share with you was, um, um, in, uh, in 2019, I was uh, uh, asked by a WeTransfer, uh, which is a, a file sharing uh, online format, but it's also become kind of a bit of a magazine, an online magazine. If there was a project that I wanted to do that, I, that I've never had an opportunity to do, I said, yeah, I'd really like to go back to Cuba and paint my friends and family again. You know, I, I had been back to see, to see them, but I never had a, an extended you know, stay there uh, and I wanted to do that. And I had this idea that maybe it would become a show for people in my town who never get to see art, you know. So they sent me there with a reporter from uh, WeTransfer and they wrote a whole story. Um, uh, Miguel Rodriguez, I want to paint reality here. Um, and you can see this if you just Google WeTransfer Idel Rodriguez, you can see the entire story. It's about, I would say, maybe about 30 to 40 different drawings and paintings. Uh, this is my godmother in her garden. So I, I went there for an afternoon and painted her. Um, and it, it was a really interesting thing because she's my godmother, but her son is in the Communist Party. And, and so is her, her mother, her, her, her daughter-in-law. So uh, they were very curious as to what I was doing there. <laughs> Why was I in Cuba painting? And then every time they would leave, my godmother would come up close to me and say, I don't like it here, but I, I can't help it. <laughs> you know. And then when the, the son would show up, she would go and smile like she's happy. And then when they would leave, she's like, I don't, I don't agree with anything they believe in, but he's my son, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so it's this constant tension where I was with the reporter and I'm about, I was about three quarters done with the painting. And I was like, I gotta leave. I can't be here. This is too, I can't concentrate with my godmother coming in my ear. And that is the tension of Cuba. This sort of like two or three storylines happening at the same time and people talking to you in the back rooms and secretly, you know. So um, this is Nilda, my, my next door neighbor. Um, and she also can't stand uh, the government, the revolution there. 
and, and I think it's a, it's when you, when people have lived under the same system for 60 years and haven't had the opportunity to vote, haven't had the opportunity to say anything different, they get so it, just utterly frustrated with everything. Uh, and they, they get to a point where they take the risk. They can't take it anymore. So they, they speak out. It's, it's sort of human nature. These are my, uh, my, my friend Yeo on the left and uh, Evelito, my, my cousin on the right. This is a full set of portraits uh, that were drawn. This is a painting that I did. Um, that's my godmother on the left. Um, and this I did when I came back and I, I had done a bunch of drawings and I had a bit more space in my studio. And I created this painting. This is at the uh, uh, We Transfer headquarters now. And finally, this is the show that I had there. I, I, I got a piece of wood and I made a wood block invite, which is in the top right over there. And I sent it out around town and I invited everybody to come to my, uh, my uh, aunt's house. And we had a show, we put up a show on the porch and it was great um, because this town never really gets to see an art show. So I hung all the paintings up on the fence. And this is my third grade teacher who came to the show. Um, and I, I was, you know, able to talk to her. Um, and all of these stories, all this stuff is the final slide is getting, um, is becoming part of my memoir, uh, which is a 300 page uh, fully illustrated um, book uh, written by me. And um, I'm just finishing up. It's on, it's on my wall right now and it'll come out next fall, uh, tw fall 2023. And the book is called Worm, um, titled after the, 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 the word that, that the Cuban government used against people that, were, um, that didn't fall in, in line. <laughs> um, and that's it. Idel, thank you so much.